On this episode of In an Instant, we're going where no Polaroid camera has gone before. For 50 years, citizens of Earth have wondered, will there be a Polaroid SX-70 successor? Can it be done? And if so, could it possibly slap as hard? Today, we answer these questions and many more as we discuss the Polaroid i2, the newest touchstone invention from Polaroid. A kind of photography that would become part of the human being press a button and have the picture. Welcome to In An Instant, my name is Ben, and after many years of speculation and contemplation, we finally have the newest incarnation of a true Polaroid benchmark camera. A successor to the legendary Polaroid SX-70 and a release that's been in arduous development for four years. It's finally here, the Polaroid i2. Much has happened since the Impossible Project first released the spiritual successor to this camera, the i1, which came out seven years ago now. At the time, it was the first Polaroid camera released in a decade, and it offered new features that Polaroid artists clamored for, including manual controls and a fully enhanced feature set supported by the Impossible Project app. The i2 comes after a flurry of growth for the Impossible Project, which has since acquired the name Polaroid and made seismic improvements in film quality, production capabilities, and global reach. Now they finally have the camera to go along with this progress. The i2 is a box-style rangefinder-focusing beauty with manual controls and a bevy of modes accessible for the first time on camera, allowing you to fully craft any Polaroid image your heart desires without the use of an app and with optics that truly do this art form justice. It's a bit challenging not to sound superfluous in describing my personal affinity for this thing. Even as a diehard Polaroid user, I sort of doubted this camera could ever be possible, or more specifically, if they could ever actually produce something in the modern era that could outclass arguably one of the greatest cameras ever manufactured. But I am sitting here today, hardly believing the words I am saying, but I'm fairly certain they've pulled it off. Okay, I was just checking that the SX-70 wasn't gonna start attacking me or something. Okay, it looks like it's not gonna do that. I have put the i2 through excessive paces this year, dragging it through every photographic inclination that meets my eye. In fact, this i2 has already been to 20% of the states in the US. Interstate i2 has passed through Massachusetts, Connecticut, Utah, Nevada, Washington State, Minnesota, New Jersey, Georgia, Nueva York, obviously, and even Idaho. And I've, I've just learned that, in fact, Utah. But this is all to say that I've really driven the i2 through a full gamut of scenarios, and it was fairly early on that I had a pretty powerful revelation. On an excursion to Massachusetts, or as my dad calls it, Massacutaquetes, I realized for the first time I hadn't brought an SX-70 with me on a shoot. I had brought the i2 instead, and as someone who has entrusted the SX-70 with some of the most meaningful moments in my life, finding that I could depend on the i2 to produce not only similar results, but in many cases better results, marked a real slap in the buns moment for me. My buns got battered. I did do some side-by-side -side testing to try and compare the glass-lensed SX-70 to the i2's lens, which is made of optical-grade polycarbonate and acrylic, and frankly, I think the i2's is just as sharp or sharper. There is much ado about glass, but as I've said in the past, high-quality plastics can be mighty crispy. I think it's pretty clear the i2 isn't suffering for clarity. The i2 has plenty in the optical chops department. Mechanical engineers Yasuke Kojima and Toshimasa Akagi attacked the creative challenge of lensing with 56 combined years of experience at Olympus, which over a century has created many prodigious lenses and cameras. Unlike cameras such as the Polaroid Now, which uses autofocusing to toggle between two separate lenses, a close-up lens and a lens focused to infinity, the i2 uses a triplet system to continuously and precisely dial focusing points between 0.4 meters to infinity. So you can hit any point between that range, and that level of accuracy is a massive benefit to sharpness and control. But how do you achieve this focus? Well, the camera has an advanced LiDAR ranging system, which, like the forefather of sonar autofocus, sends a signal that reflects off the subject at the center of frame and reports the distance both in the camera's top LCD readout and in the viewfinder. More on the viewfinder later. 
This system allows you to half press the shutter button like on the SX70 sonar and receive an amazingly precise readout which you can use to confidently smash that shutter button. If the reported distance seems wrong, you can just release the shutter button and half press again. And if you're too close, the camera also lets you know you've exceeded the minimum focusing distance. The way this works is seamless, extremely easy to handle, and essentially negates the need for manual focus, which some folks might have expected from this camera. It really isn't necessary given how well this works. You can just continuously half press, release, and adjust from there. Now, as for the viewfinder, this is indeed a rangefinder camera, unlike the SX70, which is an SLR. This essentially means your viewfinder is optically feeding light through a separate window instead of viewing it directly through the lens by way of a reflection in a mirror. The i2's viewfinder has a set of frame lines to help correct for parallax introduced by the rangefinder, so you can aim to place your composition in the smaller window as you get closer to your subject. While I have a predilection for SLRs, I do commonly use rangefinders or TLRs, so the i2's viewfinder has been an easy adjustment. The finder has a small but extensive readout below the viewing window, telling you the focusing distance you've hit with the rangefinder, your exposure meter reading, your selected aperture, shutter speed, how many shots you have left, your battery level, and if your shutter speed is slow enough to introduce camera shake. Having all of that is pretty primo, and after a minor adjustment period, I've had no issues with precision framing and composition. I give this viewfinder five out of five eyes. Now that we know how you're seeing what you're shooting, how are you shooting what you're shooting? Well, for the first time ever, we've got a Polaroid camera with fully manual controls on board. That is unquestionably big for business. A selection dial and physical exposure compensation dial make for a welcomed tactile experience, while a small screen helps you toggle between modes on board. Those include auto, which selects the shutter speed and aperture for you, aperture priority, in which you can select the desired aperture and the camera automatically selects your shutter speed up to 1 250th of a second, shutter priority, where you select the shutter speed and the aperture is auto set, and then by the grace of Edwin Land's disciples, we have a full manual mode, where you can dial in both settings based on either the camera's internal light meter reading or your own external reading. This is how I shoot the i2, all manual, treat every shot with maximum respect, really try and precise it up, chef it up, and I'm really basking in that capability, which even the SX70 doesn't have. The i2's meter is center weighted, like the autofocus, so you can lock in a meter reading and focusing point at the same time by half pressing the shutter button. Then you can reframe as desired. After that, you've got multiple exposures, fun for the whole family. You can select up to four exposures at once and a self timer of selectable settings. Great for that picture you wanted to be in or if you're on a tripod and don't wanna to touch the camera at the moment of exposure to introduce camera shake, uh, that's a good tool for that. Flash toggle is also a separate button which mercifully retains its selected state if you turn the camera on and off so you don't have to futz with it every time. You can also use the app to set any of this up, but for me, the beauty of this whole package is you don't need the app. It's all designed into the body itself. And about that design, it's quite a look. The dominating large lens emerges through this muscular top silhouette, fusing the traditional look of a Polaroid box camera with something wholly new. Very slick, handles very easily, and the lens even has a thread mount. I've put some filters on the 49 millimeter threads, which opens up an enormous world of options. 49 millimeter is the thread size of the nifty 50 Canon 50 millimeter 1.8, which is one of the most common lenses of all time. And thus there are limitless filters, step up rings for larger optical accessories. And that is really important for a camera that touts such broad control. On the camera's butt, You've got a little zone here with USB-C charging, and no, that's not a headphone jack for listening to Polaroid radio. It's a mini flash sync port. You can use external strobes and truly use every tool to make the Polaroid photos of your dreams come true. Now, instead of pros and cons, because as far as cons go, there aren't really any cons for me, let's get into some odds and ends. SX70 mode. There is an unexpected semi-hidden feature on the i2 that kind of slangs. If you drop the film door and then turn it on, you are presented with the option to change the film mode to SX70 i-type and for some reason 600, which would be the same as i-type. This mode allows you to use Polaroid SX70 film natively inside the i2, where all automatic functions will meter for the slower 160 speed SX70 film. This is sweet if you love SX70 film or if you wanna use wider apertures outdoors without an ND filter. 
And speaking of filters, let's talk a little bit more about the filter threads. As I mentioned, there's a 49 millimeter thread mount on here. This allows you to use all sorts of light filters and special effects filters with the i2. And smartly, the light meter sits within the front lens element. So the auto meter will base its reading on that light filtration. Really nice touch. Exposure precision. With the ability to manually meter for Polaroid film, creative opportunities go fully bananas and sometimes plantains. Even better, the i2's shutter speeds are ridiculously precise, ranging through the tenths in its speed range. So I found I can meter more precisely than with basically any other manual camera I own. And I do recommend external metering as it's the best way to maximize every shot. Packs of Polaroids aren't exactly something you wanna burn through willy-nilly, so you get a lot more value in slowing down and dialing it in. i2 nomenclature, you know I'm a nomenclature freak. The name i2 is a follow-up to the i1 that the Impossible Project first released in 2016. The i-type battery-free film that was released with the i1 has subsequently been sold since for all of Polaroid's modern cameras, but the name hasn't really made that much sense since they're called the Now, the One Step Two, and so on. So I think it is synergistically satisfying that the i2 now aptly ties into the i-type film. And I also dig the homage to the Impossible brand that made all of this very possible today. And price. The i2 retails for $599.99, which in some circles is also known as $600. That is about the price I expected for the premium Polaroid camera we've all been waiting for, with manually modified SX-70s running at about a thousand bucks, and similarly high-end instant cameras from Mint costing around 900 bucks. I feel like 600 is a decent price tier for the kind of artist who wants something like this. Instant cameras are fairly unique in the photo industry in that they do tend to veer on the cheaper side, but in the grand scheme of things, for a pro-level body, $600 ain't bad. And remember, the SX-70 retailed for $1,300 adjusted for current inflation, so frankly, it's a bargain. SX-70 vs. i2 notes. While I did do some side-by-side -side testing of the i2 and the SX-70 with my boy Matty Ice, I wanted to quickly note how difficult it actually was to compare these two cameras. For one, the SX-70 auto exposes, so we were having trouble getting it to produce images that looked like the i2's precisely metered images, even when using an open SX-70, which was modified for manual use. Also, the SX-70 has a 116 millimeter lens, while the i2's is a wider 98 mil. Not the biggest difference, but it has a legitimate impact while shooting. Both lenses have maximum apertures of f8, which is very large on a format of this size, but the i2 can use f8 through its entire range of focus and in any lighting, while the SX-70 oscillates apertures automatically with no user control. The ability to fold down the SX-70 is an obvious benefit for form factor, but if you're weighing the i2 upgrade, consider that the fact that the SX-70 folds and all the intricate mechanical ramifications of its design introduce a higher risk of failure after 50 years of life. The i2 comes with the benefit of the modern Polaroid company being able to service or replace it. A weak point of the i2 long-term might be its lithium ion battery that is fully enclosed within the shell of the camera, the SX-70 used film that contained batteries, so they have survived for generations without the need to replace a power source internally. But like I said, the current Polaroid company has their weight behind the i2, and they'll surely be able to service the batteries for years to come. I may produce a full episode about this comparison soon, but for now, that about does it for our introduction to the Polaroid i2. Thank you for watching In An Instant. Go ahead and manually meter for that subscribe button. Stay tuned for more reviews, breakdowns, shoots, and all things instant. Bye.